Okay, great. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, I am, as as he said, John Maloney, uh, lead developer of Microblocks. And I would have been joined today by Emily St. Germain from the Cambridge Public Library, but for reasons that she will explain herself in the video, uh, she couldn't be here today. Um, our third sort of virtual presenter uh, would be Katie Henry, who actually helped develop these ideas. Really, really, uh, over the last year and a half, Katie and I have been working to develop exploring electronics with the microbit. Um, and unfortunately, Katie couldn't be with us because she's leading some kind of microbit live conference today. So she can't, she couldn't join this presentation. Um, anyway, uh, the microbit is a fantastic tool for exploring electronics. It can be used as a power source. It can be used uh, to turn things on and off with the, with, the, with the pins. It can be used to generate signals. It can sense voltage. And it can even graph voltage over time to study time-varying behavior, such as the charge and discharge um, uh, cycle of a capacitor. We think that there's so much possibility here that uh, we, Emily and I, started talking about creating a four-session workshop about electronics that uses the microbit as a tool. Um, the workshop would be aimed at grades, U.S. grades four through seven, which is uh, ages nine through 12. And uh, we're trying very hard to recruit very deliberately from non-techie families. Uh, we don't want just the children of engineers and scientists and Harvard and MIT professors. Um, but I'll let Emily tell you a little bit more about that herself in this video that she created. Great. So... Um, <clears throat> I hope you can now see my screen again. Um, thank you very much, uh, Emily. And uh, she'll be watching this. She'll be sort of participating as soon as she can watch the, the recording of it. Well, as Emily said, we've got four sessions in our, um, <clears throat> in our, in our, our workshop. And uh, every session has associated with it some kind of project that you build, some kind of hands-on thing. Um, and at the same time, the students will be learning important principles. So the first project is to make a very simple LED light circuit. And, uh, and they'll also be learning the principles of things like what makes a complete circuit and the difference between conductors and insulators. In the second session, we'll introduce the microbit as a way to control things, and we'll make a microbit controlled traffic light. The third session will turn towards um, voltage and we'll learn what voltage is and how you can measure it and how you can make a voltmeter that will measure the, the quality of your batteries. So you can tell a good battery from a not so good battery. And we'll also make a potato battery that can actually light up an LED. The final session will focus on resistance and we'll talk about how resistors can be used to make a musical keyboard that can play six notes. So uh, the rest of this, I'm actually going to dive in and show almost all of this stuff live. So let me go ahead and show my camera view. And uh, I'll start talking about these different sessions and uh, how we're going to build things. So this is these are the materials that we'll use to build the LED light circuit. And uh, some of them came from a hardware store. This uh, coil of 24 gauge soft brass wire doesn't need to be stripped, bends really easily, can be cut with scissors. Uh, that came from a hardware store. These paper clips and brads came from an office supply store. Uh, this is a, a piece of chipboard uh, that has been laser cut to have a circuit on it and some little holes to put brads through. And then finally, we've got a few components that came from an electronics, um, electronics mail order place mouse or electronics. So we've got resistors and light emitting diodes. All of these things are very inexpensive. And that was like part of our goal was to make sure that, uh, that this could be replicated in classrooms uh, or other after school centers for not very much money. So all of these components, like for example, the LED is 10 cents, the resistor is 5 cents, the brads 5 cents, the paper clips a few cents. Everything is really, really cheap. Um, the most expensive thing in this particular circuit is the battery holder, which is $1.50 or so, um, and of course the batteries to go in it. But we're only using the battery holder in the first project so that kids will have something to take home, uh, because normally the microbit can be used as a power supply. Um, so here's what they'll build, and as I said, the idea was that we wanted something that they could take home that would be standalone, so it would work even without a microbit. 
Um, so it's a simple, uh, simple circuit that will light up this LED when I close this switch that was made out of the paper clip. So uh, embedded in this is actually a bunch of electronics principles. Um, so one of them is this idea of the difference between conductors and insulators. So the, the chipboard, the backing, is an insulator, as is the uh, plastic coating on these wires. But inside of the wires um, is actually metal. And uh, metal conducts electricity. Most metals conduct electricity quite well. So that metal is a conductor, and it's inside of those wires. Uh, likewise, the brads, the paper clip, the leads on the LED and the resistor, those are all made out of metal. So what you need to make a circuit is you need a loop. Circuit sort of means loop. So you need a way for the electricity to come from the battery through the red wire, through the paper clip, through the LED, through the resistor, and then back through the black wire to the batteries. If you don't have a complete circuit, nothing works. The, light, uh, the LED doesn't come on. So that's like a basic principle in, in every circuit that you uh, ever build, you have to sort of be able to trace the path of the electricity from uh, the power source all the way through some components back to the uh, the other, the negative side of the power source. Okay, so um, uh, before I leave this, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the construction techniques. So, um, so here's an LED light circuit. This one I actually modified to, uh, to be powered by a micro bit, just to, so you could see how that might work. Um, what I did was I, I bent the ends of the brads over to make contacts on the edge of the board that you could connect alligator, alligator clips to. To make these circuits, what you do is, um, is you insert a brad through the hole where brad is, and then, <clears throat> and then you wrap I, what I like to do is kind of put it most of the way down, and then you wrap the lead of the component, like this resistor, around the brad. And uh, then you'll, uh, when you're done with that connection, you'll fold these out. But actually, in this case, I have another thing that I have to connect, which is the LED. So the LED has one leg that's longer than the other, and that one has to go towards the positive side. So we're going to put another brad in here. And I'm going to hold the LED in place and just kind of wrap that around like so. And wrap it around, um, around this brad like so. Now I'll turn it over and I'll uh, use my fingernail to separate these guys. Oops. So that's one. And this one. Push them down nice and tight. And here's our finished circuit. So if I connected this up to a micro bit, we'd be able to turn this LED on. And that these, uh, it's a, I actually was pleasantly surprised that these brads make very good con connections um, with, with like bare wire and leads. Uh, these circuits are, are more reliable than some circuits I've built with, for example, copper tape or conductive thread. So this construction technique seems to be working uh, nicely. Okie doke. Um, well, that would be the first class was basically introducing uh, basic circuits. The next class we would do um, would, would involve using the micro bit to control stuff. So I have a little circuit here. So this is the traffic light circuit. And as you can see, um, we're using alligator clip wires to connect from pins 0, 1, and 2 to 0, 1, and 2 on the board. Again, I use that technique where there's a little bit of the brad bent over uh, that makes a place that I can connect the alligator clip to. And then we also have to have a ground to make the circuit be complete. When I turn this on, you'll see that the green LED lights up. And um, the students will write a short, a very simple program uh, to sequence this so that when you press this button, we go yellow and then red, and this will take us back to green. So they have to go to yellow, wait a little bit, change to red. And then when you click green, they have to turn off red and turn on the green LED. So this is all done uh, with just a few blocks in micro blocks or make code. Um, and, you know, and yet it's very powerful. It's like, you know, you can understand like how a traffic signal works. And you could even extend this by, for example, 
uh, adding radio remote control so that with another micro bit, you trigger uh, the traffic pattern to change and maybe it automatically goes back to green after, after uh, say a minute after you've crossed the street. So that's super powerful. That would be the second session. Um, the third session is going to uh, introduce voltage. And let me get this out of the way and start microblocks. So here we have a little microblocks program uh, that, that will report the voltage on pin one. So we're using the analog pin, uh, read analog pin block, which returns a number between 0 and 1023. And then this little bit of math is going to convert that into hundreds of a volt. So uh, 1.5 volts would read as 150. And uh, we'll just go ahead and start this up right now. And let's see, you can't see the micro bit at the moment. So here's a micro bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect uh, the yellow wire to pin one, because that's our sensing. I've still got to have a ground. And I'm going to use this to measure the voltage on some batteries. So uh, here are some batteries. And uh, what I want to do is I want to kind of get a sense of uh, like how much voltage a battery is putting out. By the way, you'll notice that this number here, this is the, the reading from, from the pin uh, converted to a voltage. And it's kind of wiggling around a bit. That's because this isn't connected to anything. So it's what's called a floating input, which means it's not really well defined exactly what number it should be giving. It's kind of picking up random electrical um, noise from the environment. But if I touch this to the three volt pad, you get a nice steady 320, which means 3.2 volts. That's the power supply um, voltage from the micro bit when it's plugged into USB. If I touch it to this uh, ground thing, we get zero because ground is our sort of zero reference. Uh, voltage is always measured relative to some, to some other thing. So let me measure the voltage of this battery. This battery is a partly used battery. And I'm going to do that by holding the, the ground against the base of the battery and touching the yellow lead to the top and then reading the number that I'm getting. So I'm seeing numbers like 1.45, 1.46. So that basically, or actually 145, but that means 1.45 volts or so. So this is supposed to be putting out 1.5 volts, but um, it's a little bit lower because this battery is partly used. Let's take a look at a really brand new battery. What does that put out? So this brand new battery is putting out 1.69, 1.7. So it's putting out more than 1.5 volts. Uh, so a fresh battery actually puts out a little bit more than 1.5 volts. And here's a, here's a very old battery that I took out of a micro bit. Um, uh, it had you know, actually stopped working like the, mic the battery was so dead. Um, but it's not zero volts. It's actually still putting out 1.2 volts. But that, when a battery is, is getting old, that's what happens. Its voltage drops down to you know, less than 1.2 1, 1 or, or less than 1.2 volts. Um, using this voltmeter, you could actually go through all the batteries in the micro bits in your classroom and figure out which ones actually needed to be replaced and which ones actually could be uh, used for a little while longer. So uh, instead of, for example, replacing all the batteries because you're not sure and you want to make sure they all work, you can actually make sure you get your money's worth out of all your batteries. OK, so um, let me clear the decks here a little bit. The next thing I want to show is how to make a battery out of a potato. Well, it's actually not just out of a potato. It's out of these other things. So these are galvanized nails. Galvanized nails are coated with zinc, and zinc is a great electrode for making batteries. And pennies, which are copper, um, which is another great other electrode for batteries. So a battery consists of two dissimilar metals and, uh, and then some kind of electrolyte. Um, the potato is going to provide the electrolyte. So potatoes contain something called phosphoric acid. And uh, that we, acids tend to make good electrolytes, at least with copper and zinc electrodes. So I'm going to plug, put a nail, a penny in one side and a nail in the other. And uh, let's, let's connect this to, the, to our voltmeter and see what happens. So the, the nail is the negative, and the copper is the positive of this little battery. 
So if I connect that up, I'm getting 76, 77. So that's basically 0.7 volts. Uh, I know from experience and also from theory that an LED needs something like about 1.8 volts uh, in order to light up. So one potato, actually we, we call a single um, unit like this a cell, one potato cell is not enough to light up an LED, but we can, we can improve this. So what we can do is we can add more potato cells to create a potato battery. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna, we're gonna, um, we're gonna put these cells in series. So one of the, the <clears throat> lessons earlier would have been uh, series and parallel circuits. So kids will get a chance to sort of um, practice what it means to put things in series. So I'm gonna make these different cells and then I'm gonna uh, grab some alligator clip wires. Short, these are short alligator clip wires, which are really great for things like this. So to connect the cells up, we wanna go from copper to zinc or to nail penny to nail, copper to zinc uh, from each cell. And that's gonna add the voltages up. So we're gonna get the voltage of this cell added to this cell added to this cell. And I think four, four cells should be enough to light our LED, but we're gonna find out. Okie doke. Um, so let's actually, before we try the LED, let's, let's measure the voltage at different places. So if I measure the voltage here, well, actually let's start with the very first one. Yeah, it's still putting out about 0.6 or 7 of 0.7 volts. If I measure it here, I'm getting 1.35 volts. So basically it's kind of like 0.65 times two. If I measure it here, I'm predicting it's gonna be about that times three. Yep, it's uh, 2.3 volts. So that probably is enough. That's probably just over the threshold to light our LED. And this one actually gets all the way up to 3.2 volts, um, at least with nothing connected to it. Now the voltage of a battery will sometimes drop a little bit when you connect it up to a load. So let me see, I need another alligator clip. I think I'll use this red one here. So I'm gonna use this red alligator clip and I'm gonna put another white one on here. So the red one is positive. And uh, here's this LED. And as I mentioned earlier, the longer leg of the LED, so this one's slightly longer, that's the positive leg. So we'll connect that to the red alligator clip. And if all goes well, when I connect this, it should light up, see, it did. So we're actually making enough electricity to light that LED. It's not super bright, uh, but it's pretty amazing that you can get electricity straight out of a potato. Now this was four potato cells. Um, oh, actually I didn't connect, I should have connected this to the copper. That's even brighter, there we go. So I was actually inadvertently only using three cells. Um, let's go back and see if it would work with just two cells. When I connect this here, I'm actually ignoring, it's not actually uh, put, using the voltage from those two extra cells. It's just using the voltage from these two cells. And that LED is pretty not lit. Uh, it's actually not lit at all. So with three cells, we get dim, dim light, and with four cells, we get pretty bright. So I've always thought this, this was a very cool experiment. Um, and you can use lemons instead of potatoes, but uh, potatoes actually, they don't, they don't make a lot of juice, so they're less messy. And uh, maybe more important, they're actually a lot cheaper than lemons. Uh, I think potatoes are like about 10 cents each and lemons are often like 50 cents each. So if you're getting a whole classroom worth of potatoes, or lemons, uh, that actually is a consideration. Um, however, I will say that I talked to one teacher earlier this week about having done the lemon experiment. And she said after she did uh, making a battery out of lemons, uh, her classroom smelled lemony fresh. So there is that about lemons. Okay, uh, let's go on to the third class. 
um, which is, uh, sorry, that was the third class. The fourth session is going to talk about resistance. So to sort of explain resistance, I made this special little circuit here. And I'm going to just use the micro bit for this as a power supply. So to do that, I'll just connect this yellow lead to the plus three and to plus three of the circuit. Um, then ground of the circuit. And uh, actually, we don't need the micro bit uh, blocks program. We're just looking at the circuit here. So let me actually just put that there. Um, we have three resistors here, 100 ohms, uh, 1K, which is uh, how we write 1,000 ohms, and 10K, which is how we write 10,000 ohms. And we have this little paper clip that can switch between them. So with 100 ohms, which is um, a small amount of resistance, we actually, it doesn't resist the electricity very much. So this smaller amount of ohms makes more electricity flow and we get a very bright LED. If I switch to this, you see it's actually dimmer because we have 10 times as much resistance. Uh, and then finally, 10 times that resistance is even a little bit dimmer. Um, in, in real life, the difference between those is more dramatic than it looks through the camera. But, um, but you can definitely see that that's brighter than that and somewhat brighter than that. Um, so that basically introduces the idea of resistance. And then we're going to take that into, um, into a, a, a circuit, and we're going to use that. We're actually going to use a chain of resistors to, uh, to make a musical instrument. So this is, this is basically a little keyboard, uh, probably with like $1 worth of components, including the, the five resistors, which are about 25 cents. And I'm using um, paper clips as the keys of this little keyboard. And I put a strip of uh, corrugated cardboard under them to leverage them up so that by default, they're actually sitting a little bit above and not making contact with the brads that they're over. Okay, so let us um, let me open up a different microblocks project and sort of explain how this is going to work. So uh, probably the quickest way. Hey, John, just wanted to let you know that you have five minutes or so left. Oh, I thought I had till 20 after. Oh, you're right. I have five minutes left. Just, right. I'm on my last thing. Thought it was yeah. a good, OK, go for it. OK, so um, thanks for the reminder. So uh, so I'm going to uh, basically show this, graph this, uh, this the output of this. So, th so when nothing is connected, I'm actually getting uh, 1023. So this is raw numbers as opposed to voltage. If I press this key, oops, I have to connect this up. Ha <laughs> ha. So pin one to pin one, ground to ground. Um, if I press this, then I've got a straight path from pin one to ground. So we're basically grounding pin one and we get a zero. If I press this, I get a big number. Um, and if I press some of these intermediate ones, I'm getting different numbers. And over here on the graph, actually, if I say zero at bottom, you'll see this is the lowest number. This is a medium number. This is higher, 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 higher. And with no key connected, it goes all the way up to 1023. So that way I know nothing is connected. Um, I'll start this program, which is going to use those numbers to make musical notes. And I'm going to hold the micro bit close to my uh, headset so that you can hear it. Ah, hopefully the wires, let's see. OK, here we go. Um, So there we have a musical keyboard uh, made for about a dollar's worth of components uh, and, and the micro bit, and it really works. Uh, see, I have, okay, I have, a, I have just enough time, I think, to do one more thing. So I want to show, that, that would be where our class ended. Um, uh, but I wanted to show one quick thing about capacitors just uh, to show what's possible if you go a little bit beyond in a more advanced class, what might be possible. So this is a circuit that I made um, that uh, shows, will show the charge and discharge curve of a capacitor. 
And uh, the way it works briefly is that pin two is going to be used as a switch to sort of uh, send electricity into the capacitor or to drain it out of the capacitor through this one ohm resistor. Um, so actually, I'm going to move this off screen because there's not much to see, uh, but there will be stuff to see on the graph. So um, when I press the A button, uh, it should start graphing. Oh, it's it started graphing. Oh, let me put zero at the bottom. Okay, when I press the A button, the capacitor charges, and you notice that it didn't happen immediately. And when I press the B button, it discharges. So let me actually I'm I'm not pressing the buttons, but I will. A, B, and then I'm going to stop. So this graph that you get, this kind of uh, rising curve and falling curve, that's the charge and discharge. Um, curves of a capacitor. And it works at any time scale. I'm using kind of a big capacitor so that we can actually see this. But one more kind of cool thing that you can do is if I charge this capacitor up and I stop this, um, I'm going to actually discharge the capacitor through this LED. And uh, if, if I do this right, let's see, get this on the screen so you can see it. Uh, you should see a little flash as the capacitor discharges through the LED. And there you have it. So the capacitor stored some energy and we discharged it through the LED. All right, uh, with that and one minute left, I will wrap up and see if there are any questions. I'm gonna stop sharing. A fantastic presentation, John. There was some questions around um, where the best place to find resistors are, whether it's a hardware store, or if it is an electronic component store? Well, sadly, Radio Shack is no longer in business. Um, so you can't just go to your radio, uh, local Radio Shack. Um, but there's a bunch of mail order places. I got these from Mouser Electronics. I think they're actually pretty, uh, pretty decent. Um, you can also get resistors from and, and LEDs from places like Adafruit Electronics and maybe SparkFun. Um, those are good places. Uh, uh, Mouser probably has the best prices because they're like a big, you know, wholesaler. Oh yeah, RS Online. Yeah, I mean, you can get also DigiKey. You can get to more and more sort of serious electronics places. Mouser's kind of in between. I think their website's a little easier to use than um, than DigiKey, for example. Um, but they still have a huge selection of, of different things. Oh, I was going to say, um, I actually have. Uh, I made a a resource guide um, for anybody who wants to try some of these things. Uh, let's see. Can we share this link in the chat? That would be fantastic. And just to honor time, as there's about a five-minute transition, John, the best place, if you can use yet, yeah, you're using the chat uh, to connect or follow you. Um, there's such ins it's inspirational comments and connections to the approach and your learning design in terms of how you're exploring and sharing and democratizing those opportunities for easily easier access um, with that mindset's incredible. So any, any ways to type, to tap into the microblock um, platform and or follow your journey would be appreciated. Yep, absolutely. Um, so, uh, so actually you can apply all of this with other software besides microblocks. Although I think the graphing works rather nicely in microblocks um, and uh, I put in this folder, I put uh, sort of a synopsis of the course, as well as all of the, um, all of the uh, uh, circuit board layouts that are, we're using and the microblocks programs. So feel free to explore that. And uh, sorry, I went over a minute or so. Thanks for your expertise. I'm gonna check out, please use the chat and connect with John through the various channels here. And uh, for the rest of you here, there'll be more sessions uh, coming at you. So please go check out the session area. And thanks again, John, for an incredible presentation. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for